This morning we're going to continue our study through the book of Exodus. We've been in this fascinating book for several months studying what God is teaching us through the story of the people of Israel in bondage and how they are delivered. And after today, for the next month and a half, we're going to take a break from Exodus. We're going to have different speakers come up, share on different things that God is laying on their hearts. And in August, once school starts again, we're going to jump back into this book and look at the plagues and what they will teach us about God and what they will teach us about ourselves. And so over the course of the last several weeks, we've learned a lot of different things about God. We've learned he's patient. We learned he's in control. We learned he's present. We learned that he is trustworthy. Things that have challenged us, things that have encouraged us, and some things that have just been too plain hard for us to grasp. But if we're honest with ourselves, the hardest thing of all is not trying to grasp the greatness and the character of God. The hardest thing for most of us, myself included, is learning to trust God with our lives. To believe that in our hearts that he is absolutely trustworthy. Two weeks ago, we began to look at this characteristic of God, and I want us to look at it again this morning as we dive into Exodus 6. And I want us to answer the question again that we asked a couple weeks ago, do you believe that God is trustworthy? Do you believe that God is trustworthy? I mean, in the face of uncertainty, in the face of difficulty, in the face of wondering if things are going to turn out okay, in the face of trial, do you really truly believe that God is trustworthy. See, it's one thing to affirm, yes, God is trustworthy, but it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different ball game to, for you and I to actually believe it. The Bible over and over and over affirms that God won't bend or renege on his promises. He doesn't, he doesn't have it in him to lie or to change. He is bound and determined he is driven to do what he says he will do. He will always come true. He will always fulfill his promises. He may sometimes delay on his promises, but he will not deny his promises. One old dead pastor, Thomas Watson, said it this way, that God's promises may lay in the ground as a seed for a season, but eventually, in his time, it will spring up. So far in the book of Exodus, we've seen the people of Israel in bondage, trapped in Egypt, but they've been promised that God would deliver them. A promise that God made to Abraham 400 years earlier, but for a long, long time. It's been years of nothing but bleak, dark, confusing, suffering, pain, and death. And the question that they're asking is, will God come through? Will he fulfill his promise of deliverance? And what we've seen in the story so far from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 5 is that no one actually believes that God would do this. Moses, from the very beginning, doubted God. But he finally agrees to go along with the plan. And to his shock, the people of Israel initially were excited about it. They thought that God was going to deliver them. They threw their hands in the air. And it was a big party when Moses came and told them everything that God said. Things looked pretty good, but when Moses went to Pharaoh and Pharaoh rejected them, the people then turn their backs on Moses. The people run back to Pharaoh for mercy instead of to God like they should have done. And Moses, and even though he turned back to God, he again doubted if this was right, if this was ever going to happen. He wondered if God would ever really show up. You see, Moses obeyed God, but when he obeyed God, things actually got worse instead of better. It didn't turn out the way he thought it would turn out. He was obedient. He did everything God told him to do, but things actually got worse for him. But God was calling Moses to trust in his providence. And he's calling you and I to do the same. And this morning in chapter 6, we're gonna, God is going to call Moses to trust the promises he gave him, and he's going to call us to do the same as well. And the text is going to remind us that the promises of God are absolutely trustworthy. I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like there are seasons in my life where God is just talking, and he makes all these promises, but he's just talking and never shows up. That he just says a bunch of stuff, 
and you look around your life and you feel that even though God has promised to take care of you and provide for you and adopt you as his child and adopt you into his family, oftentimes he's either a mean, abusive father or at best he's an absentee father. You ever feel like that? You pray and it feels like he doesn't answer. You ask God for something and you think it's the best way to go and God doesn't show up. And you, you say, but I'm part of your family and it feels like you've abandoned me. You're not there for me. Let me encourage you, you're not alone. Because what we're going to discover in our text is Moses felt like that. Moses wondered if God was going to show up. And God, in speaking to Moses in Exodus 6, is going to speak directly to us as well. And what we're going to discover is three things from our text this morning. Number one, we're going to, God's going to remind us to remember the promises of God. Number two, trust the God of the promise. And number three, obey the God of the promise. Remember, trust, and obey. First point, remember the promise of God. Look at verse 1 of Exodus 6. The Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. What we discover here is God basically reiterating the same things he told Moses earlier. The same thing he told him in chapter 2, in chapter 3, and now in chapter 5, in chapter 6. He's saying the exact same thing. He hasn't changed his mind. The plan hasn't changed because Pharaoh rejected him. God is still on course. He's still moving ahead, even though it seems like the opposition is incredibly great. He tells Moses that he is going to, it's going to take a strong hand for Pharaoh to let the people go. And I'm sure Moses is sitting there wondering, well, what are you waiting for? Let's see that strong hand of yours. Let's see you show up. Verse 2, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I love God's response here. He says, I am Yahweh. In other words, Moses, I'm God, you're not. Moses, I don't need to give you an answer for what's going on. I'm God. And you know what? Moses didn't want to be God. And in our heart of hearts, we don't want to be God. But oftentimes we act like we're God and we're in control of our lives. Moses is anxious. Moses is restless. He's rustling. He's fidgety. He's uneasy. He's restless. Everything he can see through his eyes doesn't match up with what God has promised, at least from his point of view. You can imagine Moses pacing the floor, sweat pouring from his head, heart racing a hundred miles an hour, and God grabs him by the shoulder, looks him deep into his eyes, all the way down to his soul, and he says, listen, Moses, I'm God. You're not. I'm God. I don't know about you, but I think I need to be reminded of that often. Because when I get anxious and worried and confused about my life, I need to be reminded that he's God. I'm not. That I'm his. I belong to him. And if I'm his, he will take care of me. And Moses needs to be reminded of that. God, through the psalmist, would encourage us with these words. He would say, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Moses needed to hear that. And listen, so do you and I. And notice, God doesn't tell Moses to cheer up. He doesn't tell him to take it like a man. He doesn't tell him to get a grip on it or snap out of it. He doesn't invite in him or even into a conversation, or even promise any change in Moses, but simply tells him to remember who he is and who he is talking to. What you're going to discover in Exodus 6 is basically everything in Exodus 6. You've heard it in Exodus 2, 3, 4, and 5. God is basically repeating everything over and over. There is no new information here. There's no new revelation. There's no new plan or no, no new idea. Just a call to remember what has already been revealed. You know, so much of our walk, of our Christian walk, is simply being reminded of what is true. Do you know in Scripture, there is over 160 times the call for us to remember. Remind ourselves who God is. Remind ourselves 
what God has done. Acts 20, remember the words of Jesus, how he said he was more blessed to give than to receive. 2 Timothy, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead for you. Even communion that we take every Sunday is a reminder, a remembrance of what Jesus did so that you and I can be a part of his family. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Why? Why is there a constant call for us to remember? Because the reality is you and I often forget who God is. We forget. In the busyness of life, and when things go wrong, we forget that God is faithful. We forget how good he is. And It is in our forgetting of the gospel, forgetting who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Listen, that is the root for all of our sins, is that we forget. The rebellion of the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness was that they forgot who God was. Our sins that we do in our lives, at the core of it, is that we forget who God is. It's the reason for our unbelief. It's the reason that we don't love him as we should. It's the reason we put everything else above him is because we forget who he is. It's the reason we give in to fear because we forget that he will never leave us or forsake us. It's the reason we rebel because we think that there's something else out there that's better than God is. See, this is the primary reason scripture encourages us to be people of the word, to be grounded in the word, that this is not just a textbook about who God is, but this is a reminder from page one to the end of who God is and what he's done and how faithful he is and how he is there for you. This is why you should be people of the word. This is not a book you pick up on Sunday mornings, but it's something that you should get inside of you. Because when you're out there, it's so easy for us to forget. Be people of the word. Let me encourage you. Be someone who loves God's word. Read it often. Read it so that you are reminded of who God is, what he's done, that he is faithful, and that no matter what you're going through, he is with you. Be people of God's word. Verse 3. Here's God speaking to Abraham, um, Moses, and he says, I appear to Abraham, I appear to Isaac, I appear to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. What's God doing here? He's basically telling Moses of his track record. He has been very active. He's cared for the people before. He's always watched out for his people. He didn't just talk a good talk, but he backed it up always. And the text says something here interesting. God revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but not as Yahweh. What does that mean? He means that the guys from Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they they knew God as Yahweh, but they didn't fully understand it as Moses is getting the privilege to do. God is making a promise, but here Moses is going to experience that promise. The key difference between Genesis and Exodus is that Abraham and his family knew God as a promise maker, but Moses and the people of Israel are going to see him as a promise keeper, completely the key, main key difference between the two books. Verse, six, verse 5. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the people in Israel whom the Egyptians held, hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. God's saying that he will come through with his promises. He has truly heard and seen these people suffering. He has made a covenant, and he is going to fulfill it, and Moses is going to see it with his very own eyes. Keep reading verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you out into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord." God's again telling Moses to go back and tell them exactly the same thing that he's told them before. God's saying, I haven't changed my mind. What I said I will do, but it's on my watch and on my timetable, not yours. And notice the resolve of God in these verses. We are to remember God, but particularly remember that God is determined to fulfill his promises. Look at the number of I wills in these three verses. 
I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land. I will give it to you. God is pretty determined to make this happen. Every verb, and George can correct me on this if I'm wrong, is in the Hebrew perfect, or past tense, instead of the future tense. It sounds like future tense in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's Hebrew perfect. Why? Because God is so certain of his accomplishment of the promises that in his eyes, these are viewed as are already done. It's already going to happen. It's already, it's finished. That goes along with his name Yahweh, the eternally existing one. Notice what God promises to do. He promises to bring them out. He promises to bring them to himself. And he promises to bring them to a new place. And you know, that's a picture of what God is doing with his people even today. He brings us out of sin through redemption, doesn't he? He adopts us into his own family as his children, and then he brings us to himself and eventually will bring us to him to home in glory. This is salvation, sanctification, glorification pictured here in the story of Exodus. It is all God saving us. He saved us from the penalty of sin. He is currently saving us from the power of sin, and he will ultimately one day save us from the presence of sin. God is at work in our lives. Listen, the promise of God is that he is at work, and he will keep his promises to take you all the way to glory. He will not abandon you. He will not forsake you. If he has started the work, he will finish it. The words of Paul in Philippians, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus. Friends, remember the God of the promise. He's not done with you. He's still at work, still active, even if you don't feel it. He's still working in you. John Patton was a missionary that had nothing go right in his life, even though he decided to pursue Jesus. He uprooted his entire life, his entire family, to live on a chain of islands in the Pacific with cannibals with the hope that the gospel would change their lives. He gets there and the people steal everything that he has. They destroy his home. They tear up his books. They steal his boat. And after years, he raises money to purchase a ship so that he can send natives to other islands so that they can preach the gospel. And then the unthinkable happens. After just the fourth trip between the islands, the ship that he saved so much money for, that he raised so much money for, hits a reef and it sinks. And here's what John Patton wrote. He said, the, the wreck was, in all the circumstances, one of the bitterest sorrows of my life. For one, though firmly believing that her loss was a blow to the higher interests of our mission, I was able to say the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, but yet, God, forgive me, it was very hard for me to add, blessed be the name of the Lord. But never in the, my deepest soul did I for a moment doubt that in his hand all must be well. Whatever trials has befallen me in my earthly pilgrimage, I have never had the trial of doubting that perhaps, after all, Jesus made some mistake. No, my blessed Lord makes no mistakes. And you know, about all the sorrows and difficulties that he's faced on the mission field, it was the death of his precious wife and his baby boy that was the hardest for him as a missionary. He hadn't been married for less than a year, and only on the, he hadn't been married for a little over a year, and only on the island for less than that, and before his wife dies, and pretty soon after that, his baby dies. And here's what he says. He says, then in a moment, altogether unexpectedly, my wife dies on March 3rd. To crown my sorrow and to complete my loneliness, the dear baby boy whom we named after her father was taken from me just after one week on the 20th of March. Let those who have passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me. As for all others, it would be more than vain to try to paint my sorrows. Stunned by that deadly loss, in entering upon this field of labor in which God himself so evidently led me, my reason for a time almost seemed to give way. But I was never altogether forsaken. The ever merciful Lord sustained me to, my, to, the precious, to bury my precious dust of my beloved ones in a quiet grave, 
dug for them by the end of my house, in all of which, by my own hands, despite breaking hearts, had to take the principal share. I built the grave round and round with coral blocks, covered the top with a beautiful white coral, broken small as gravel, and that spot became my sacred and much frequented shrine. During all the following months and years, when I labored on for the salvation of these savages amidst difficulties, dangers, and death. And notice these words. He says, whenever this island turns to God, whenever it is one for Christ, men in after days will find the memory of that spot still green, where with ceaseless prayers and tears I claimed this land for God, which I had buried my dead with faith and hope, but for Jesus and the fellowship he vouchsafed to me there, I would have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave, but he fulfilled his own promise. I will not forsake you. I will not fail you. So we need to remember the promises of God. He has yet to fail any of his children, and he's not about to do it now. Encourage each other to remember God. Secondly, we're called to trust the promises of God. Trust the promises of God. Listen, Moses had nothing to fall back on or to cling to as evidence that God was going to come through. 400 years, the people have been bondage. They have never heard the voice of God. He had only the spoken word of God to him, and that was it. And the text tells us that there is nothing in the lives of the people around him to encourage him, nothing in Moses' own background to pull from or even in the future for him to pull from. Moses would have to trust in God alone and there would be no other way. Look at verse 9. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Man, Moses goes once, they got excited, but then Pharaoh turns on him. They turn on him, and now he goes back again after hearing God's voice, thinking the people might have changed their hearts, but they again don't want to hear it at all. The Hebrew is that they didn't listen for shortness of breath. It's the idea that they are gasping for air, and they don't have the time, the energy, or the interest in anything that Moses is saying because they're just trying to survive in bondage. So here Moses is all alone again, a familiar place for him to be. He wants to trust God, but there's no help from the culture around him because no one believes him. You know, we live in a culture that forces us to swim upstream. There are many in our culture that are without Jesus, and they think that we are weird for actually believing that what he says is true. But Jesus is calling us, just as he called Moses, to trust him despite the responses of the people around him. Daniel and his three friends did this. Every one of the disciples did this. Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, did this when he was repeatedly asked to recant and all the things that he wrote, here's what Luther said. He said, unless I am convinced by scripture and by plain reason in those scriptures that I have presented, for my conscience is captive to the word of God, I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against the conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Amen. This was hard for Moses to do. He flat out distrusts God at this point. Look at verse 10 and verse 11. The Lord says to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go. But Moses says to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. God tells Moses, Go back to Pharaoh again. This is risky. This doesn't make sense, humanly speaking. Any street cred that Moses had at this point, it is all going to be gone after this. He's going to lose it all. Verse 13. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. God still remains stubborn and resolute and tells Moses and Aaron to go back to Pharaoh. And Moses has to step out in faith even when everyone else around him does it. And if you read the text afterward, all of a sudden it turns into a, like a Hebrew phone book. It is just a list of names of people. Almost feels out of place. But this is written for the sake of the reader. This is not something told to Moses by God, 
But this is something that the writer wants us to know. The writer who happens to be Moses himself. And the next several verses are all a list of names of Moses' family. And you've got to understand the culture and the role of the family and heritage. See, we live in an individualized Western culture that prizes ourselves more than we do our own family. But that wasn't the case here. When a person needed courage or hope, they would refer back to the family line and say, remember how God did this through Abraham? Remember how God did this through Isaac, through Jacob? We are taught to look in ourselves to find courage, but in this culture, in um, Moses' culture, they were taught to look back, remember what God has done. He couldn't find courage in the people around him. They were all rejecting God. They didn't trust what Moses was saying. So he looks back at his own family. And you know what's ironic is he doesn't find much there either. The list of people that are listed in Exodus 6, they're not all stars. They're failures. They're people that have consistently failed in their walk with God. The only one that you could maybe say is an all-star there is Moses' mother. Other than that, there's no one of significance. There's Reuben, one of Joseph's brothers, who sold Joseph into slavery. Simeon and Levi were the two brothers who wiped out an entire nation because that one person in that city raped their sister. There's The list goes on and looks into the future and talks about a guy named Korah. Korah was a guy who would lead a massive rebellion against Moses in the wilderness. And then there's Moses' brother Aaron. You don't realize in Numbers 12, Aaron actually turns against Moses as well. There's nothing in this story to say, Moses, you have people in your own family, in your own lineage that are going to encourage you. So Moses basically looks around himself to find encouragement. There's no one. He looks into his past to find encouragement. There's no one. He looks into the future to find encouragement. There's no one. You ever feel like you're on an island in your faith? That's Moses' life. All alone. No one to encourage him. Turn over to chapter 7. And the Lord said to Moses in verse 1, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. God calls Moses to trust him again. God even promises for the first time that Moses will be a changed man. God is going to make Moses his divine representative. And yet things are still not going to get easier. This is God's own words in verse 2. You shall speak all that I command you. And your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though, and though I will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. God tells Moses again the promise, I am going to deliver you. But listen, Moses, Pharaoh is not going to let you go. Pharaoh will continue to harden his heart. God will make it happen in the face of all odds, but Pharaoh, but it's going to be a while. But God tells Moses, you're winning. You will conquer. You will come through. You just have to wait and see. And in doing so, God will make himself known and show his glory to all of Egypt. Moses would need to remember the God of the promise, but he would also need to trust the God of the promise. Sometimes when there's no one around you to encourage you, you just need to trust that God is working. Finally, you're called to obey the God of the promise. Look at verse 6. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Here's now Moses and Aaron, they just obey. No more details. No more debates, no more doubts, no more questions. Finally, Moses just shuts his mouth and heads down, puts his head down and believes that God is true and puts one step in front of another. He begins to walk finally by faith. And that's hard, isn't it? You know, it's many ways it's easier to obey God when everything is revealed very clearly, when you know exactly what's going to happen. It would have been much easier for Moses if God said to Moses, hey, go do this, and in three weeks or four weeks, you will have deliverance. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't tell him when everything's going to happen. He just basically reminds him that he is God, that he is faithful, 
and he encourages Moses to trust and to obey. See, when we walk by sheer faith in God's character, we are obeying him without knowing the extent, the duration, the frequency of the painful advent circumstances we're in. We're always coping with the unknown. We don't know how long we need to hold on or brace ourselves, but we hear the Savior remind us, I have you. I'm with you. I will not abandon you. Verse 7 tells us some added information about their age. Why? Because it's pretty unheard of. To spend 80 years of your life not believing God, doubting God, and then to actually repent and to start believing God at the age of 80 is a rare thing. There's hope here, right? If two 80-year-old men who have done nothing but doubt God their entire lives can now turn from skeptics to believers and follow God, then so can we. And yet, I don't know about you, but when I read this text, I can't help but think, this is amazing that they obeyed God and they trusted God, but these guys had God appear to them in a burning bush. These guys had God speak to them face to face. If I had that kind of verbal spoken word from God, then I would be more inclined to trust him. But all I have is a book. This is all I have. Listen to the words of Peter in 2 Peter. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountains. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Listen, Peter's saying, we have something more sure in your hands. You have the word of God, which is better than a verbal word coming from heaven. You say, but Sam, it's just hard. I have a hard time believing. And you're right. It is hard. As a matter of fact, it's impossible. But there is one who did believe God, and he walked in obedience Jesus. Look at these words from Hebrews 10. It says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices you take no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Jesus came to do the will of God, and that's exactly what he did. He obeyed God perfectly. Why? So that you and I can have a good example to follow? So that Jesus can be our role model? No. He obeyed God perfectly for you and for me. He obeyed the law and trusted God to perfection so that you and I can get the credit for it. So that when you put your faith in Jesus, when you put your trust in Jesus, you receive the righteousness of Jesus. The perfect life of Christ is given to you. So now when God looks at you this morning, if you belong to him, you are one he looks at you as if you trusted and obeyed him completely because when he looks at you, he doesn't see you and all your sins, but he sees Jesus. He lived his life perfectly so that you can be accepted by God. Trusting God is hard work. Paul calls it a fight of faith. Taking God at his word is going to be tough, but we have a Savior who's done it for us. And I don't know about you, but knowing that Jesus has done it for me takes a whole lot of burden off of me. He's not going to strike me down for my weak faith. But I just have to be willing to trust him enough to help me with my lack of faith. See, it's not about how strong your faith is. It's about how strong your Savior is. Let me conclude. Imagine you're on a high cliff and you're climbing, you're rock climbing and you lose your footing and you begin to fall. And just beside you as you're about to fall is a branch that's sticking out of the edge of the cliff. 
It is your only hope, and it is more than strong enough to support your weight. How can that branch save you? If your mind is filled with intellectual certainty, this branch is strong enough, it can support me, it will hold me up, but you never actually reach out and grab it, you're doomed. But if your mind is filled with doubt and uncertainty that the branch could hold you, but you actually do reach out and grab it and hold on to it, you'll be saved. You'll be rescued. Why? Because it's not in the strength of your faith, but it's the object of your faith that actually saves you. It's not your faith that brings your salvation. It is the object of your faith. Too many times we talk about my faith, our faith, how we can do stuff. It's not about our faith. It's about the object of our faith. We serve a God who is big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to do what he has promised to do. Maybe this morning you're struggling, you have doubts, you have uncertainty, you wonder if God is faithful. It's not about the... It's not about the size of your faith. It's about the object of your faith. Your God is big. Your God is strong. Your God is powerful. The Romans, I believe it was the Roman centurion in Mark that said, Lord, help my unbelief. And that's what God is calling us to do. Help my unbelief. I doubt I wonder, I question, but you don't change. You remain strong, you remain able. This morning when we come to the communion table, there are broken pieces of bread and a juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for our sins. That table communicates to us that when we are weak, he's strong. And when we had no way to obtain salvation on our own, He shows up and provides it for us. That He is the object, the source, the strength of our life. That it's not about how well we perform, it's not about how well we do. It's about how faithful He is. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. As you come to the table this morning, I'm going to invite you, if you have doubt, if you have worries, if you have concerns, the God that you serve is big enough to handle it, and he's there for you. Lean on him, trust him, Go to him. May he be your source this morning. Let's worship him this morning.